the book of Philemon this morning as we continue our series on victory in Jesus. How many of you have ever said, that's just not fair? Anybody, come on. There's more than that. If your hand's not up, how many of you are liars? No, I'm not going to say that. If we haven't said it, we've certainly thought it. Life's not fair. We're going to experience unfair circumstances in life. It's an absolute certainty that you and I will face injustice. Just looking at the history of our country, our nation, uh, we see the blight of slavery when it began. Millions of people taken from their homes, brought to another country to work without any rights. In the last century, as we look across the globe, we've seen and know of six million Jews dying in the Holocaust as Adolf Hitler tries to exterminate the Jewish race. You think of Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union, uh, responsible for the deaths of over 70 million people. But injustice is not just cultural and historical. It's often very personal. Situations come into all of our lives that are simply unfair. Just not right. Think about the Apostle Paul who wrote nearly half of the New Testament. He faced injustice in his life. He referred to himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Just for being a bold witness, just for his strong faith, that caused him to suffer unfairly. And we're going to see in this letter that he writes to one of his beloved friends. We'll see later on in the verses that he's writing it to Philemon. And Philemon is someone who Paul has led to Christ. Another brother in Christ in the city of Colossae. Uh, The apostle Paul is writing this letter to Philemon. And he's writing about a certain individual. Notice down in verse number 10 of the book of Philemon. It says this, I beseech thee for my son, and here's his name, Onesimus. Now, before we keep reading, let's make a quick uh, historical observation and see what this is talking about. Onesimus, he call, Paul calls Onesimus his son. Now, it wasn't his physical son. This was someone who Paul also had led to a saving knowledge of Christ. He refers to folks that he leads to Christ as his son throughout the New Testament. The same thing with Timothy and and Titus and others. So this is someone, Onesimus, who Paul has led to Christ. Now, as with many of his letters, I imagine you can guess where Paul is writing this from. Take a wild guess. Jail, prison. He's under house arrest in Rome. And he says, "I'm, I'm beseeching thee for my son Onesimus. And notice the next phrase, whom I have begotten in my bonds. What is he saying here? He's saying, since I've been in prison under house arrest here in Rome, I've met Onesimus. Now, was Onesimus perhaps a fellow cellmate? Maybe. Was Onesimus someone that was just passing through and visiting and wanted to meet Paul? Perhaps. But either way, their paths have crossed. And when they did, Paul tells Onesimus about Jesus. And he wins him to Christ. And Onesimus stays there, hangs around, and begins to help Paul. So Paul is writing to Philemon about Onesimus. Are you following along? About this one who he's just met. What's the big deal about Onesimus? Verse number 11, which in time past was to thee unprofitable. As we go forward here in a little bit, we'll see that Onesimus was a runaway slave. Onesimus was owned by Philemon. One of Philemon's slaves was this man Onesimus who had run away. And he's run from Colossae, had ended up in Rome, had met Paul. Paul leads him to Christ. So Paul's writing a letter back to the slave owner. Are we following along? And by the way, lest you think the Bible is pro-slavery, Uh, it's not at all. And we'll see that here as we go forward. 
And anyone who says that about the Bible obviously hasn't read or understood the mind of the Bible and, and Jesus himself. So Paul meets Onesimus, leads him to Christ, finds out he's a runaway slave, finds out he knows the owner, Philemon, writes a letter. He used to be unprofitable to you, he says in verse 11, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again. He's sending Onesimus back to Philemon. Whom I have sent again, that thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own vows, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel, but without thy mind would I do nothing. What's he saying? Philemon, he's been a big help to me. I wanted to keep him here. But once I found out he was a runaway slave from you, I can't do that to you. I, I want to be a man of integrity. I want him to go. I want this relationship restored. Continue on in verse 14. That thy benefits should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. We'll see what that means in a little while. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant. A brother, beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. It's amazing. He knows the story of Onesimus, and Onesimus probably has told him, not only did I leave, but I stole from him too. I took stuff of his. Paul's saying when he comes back, whatever debt he owes, put it on my tab. Verse number 19, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. I love how he concludes this. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. <laughs> so he, he, he tells Philemon, whatever debt Onesimus owes, put it on my tab. But don't make me remind you how much you owe me, buddy. <laughs> we can just about call it even, right? That's what he's saying. From this passage, from these three men, I believe we can see the formula of how to have victory over injustice. Victory over injustice. Let's bow for prayer. Ask the Lord to speak to us in this time. Lord, we come to this part of the service asking for your favor, your blessing, your spirit, your hand on this time. May our hearts and minds be focused. May we not be distracted in what the devil wants us to, to think about or to feel, but may we see the truth of your word come alive in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We see injustice throughout this passage that we just read. I'd say it wasn't fair for Onesimus to be a slave. Not fair to him. I'd say it wasn't fair for Philemon to have a slave run away and steal from him. Furthermore, I'd say it wasn't fair for Paul to be in jail right now simply for preaching the gospel. We got three men who are dealing with injustice, unfair circumstances in life, each of them had the opportunity to sink in resentment and in bitterness for what God had allowed to happen in their lives. God, though, worked through these circumstances to bring Onesimus to himself. God worked through these circumstances to bring Onesimus to himself and these three men closer to each other. You know what's wonderful to consider? And to imagine and to understand that injustices in our lives never take God by surprise. Oh, it may take us by surprise. We may not understand. We may not figure out why all this is going on and why we're being, being treated unfairly. But mark it down. It's not catching God off guard. The injustice in your life is not causing God to scramble around in heaven and try to figure up a plan to make this all work out. What's incredible for me to realize and to understand if I'm going through any kind of injustice in my life is that God is bigger. Amen. You say bigger than what? Yes. <laughs> He's bigger. 
So that injustice that you may be facing, that's certainly unfair, that certainly is undeserved, I'm not even saying that God brought it into your life. I am saying God allowed it and that he's bigger. Amen. Bigger than any trouble. Bigger than any mountain. Bigger than any unfair injustice that you may be fa facing. And God works through these circumstances in this passage to bring one man to himself, Onesimus, trust Christ. And now Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus are all in a close relationship together. God is able to make any circumstance work for our good when we trust him. That's what Romans 8, 28 tells us. All, all things work together for good to them that love God. To them are the called according to his purpose. Why? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He says, this may be in your life and you may not understand and it may be unfair. But if you trust me. If you look to me, if you don't sink in resentment and bitterness, but trust me, I can make you more like me. Amen. Yeah. And it can work out for your good. And that's what we see in this passage. As we begin, we see the reality of injustice. It's real. We will face injustice. These three men are facing it. Onesimus was considered an unprofitable servant, verse 11 says. Mm -hmm. It's the way he was described. It literally means he was useless. That probably meant he wasn't of much value to that household of Philemon. Apparently, he wasn't reliable as a worker at one time. Uh, apparently, uh, obviously, he had run away. And so Philemon didn't consider him to be worthwhile. He was unprofitable. In that culture, and it's specifically in the Roman Empire, it was not uncommon for slaves to run away from their masters. Oftentimes, they were treated harshly or unkindly. However, there were so many of them. At one point, studies show there were as many as 60 million slaves. Wow. And so what they did, what the leaders did to try to alleviate the problem and the potential of a rebellion of all the slaves together against a group, what they did is they uh, made it a capital offense for a slave to flee from the master. What does that mean? That means the owner had the right to have any recaptured slave put to death. So you see the situation Onesimus is in now? A runaway slave and Paul's sending him back? He could die for this. Despite the difficult circumstances, though, in Onesimus' life, God had a purpose. God had a plan for what was happening. Was it fair to him? No. Did it work out for him? Oh, we're going to see how it does. We're going to see how the difficulty and the injustice and the unfair circumstances, God worked out for his good. And I'm here to tell you this morning, he can do the same in your life. The situations that you're facing this morning that no one else in this room knows that are unfair to you, God has a purpose and a plan. I'm not here to say that God doesn't. I'm here to say that God is bigger than it. In Christ, all men are profitable. Verse 11 says, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. That's actually what Onesimus name means. Useful, profitable. And when Onesimus became a Christian, everything changed in his life from unprofitable to profitable. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. What does that mean? It means old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And when we come to Christ and we come to a saving knowledge of him, he has use for us. We're profitable. Onesimus was considered an unprofitable servant. We're talking about the reality of injustice. But you know what else is true? Onesimus was saved, but was still suffering. When he trusted Christ as Savior, he was still suffering. He was still in prison there with Paul. God never promised we would be exempt from injustice as a Christian. 
Bad things happen to good people. It's just the bottom line. Perhaps you've seen someone on TV, perhaps even a preacher, claiming that if you'll just give your life to God, you'll continually have good health. If you'll just send money into this church, you'll continually have good wealth. I have no idea what Bible they're preaching from, but it's not this one. It's not what God said. It, 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 salvation doesn't solve all of our problems of life. It didn't for Onesimus. He was still in prison. He still had unresolved issues with Philemon. Injustice this morning strikes the life of a Christian just as it does an unbeliever. However, I want us to understand this. A mature believer, a mature believer when we suffer persecution and injustice focuses on their responsibility and not their right. Let me take just a moment and park it here for a moment. As a Christian, it's not about what rights we have, it's about what responsibility we have. I'm not here to go around and say, I'm a child of God and you're treating me unfairly and I've got a right for this and I've got a right for that. That's certainly all we see all around us. I'm not talking about as a citizen of a free country. I'm talking about as a child of God. A mature believer is not just going to focus on my rights. You don't have a right to do this to me. There's never going to be victory there. But the Bible does give us plenty of responsibility that we have as someone who's been treated unjustly, as someone who's been treated unfairly. There are responsibilities that we have, and a mature believer will focus on that. If Onesimus had remained bitter at Philemon for owning him, or if Philemon had remained bitter at Onesimus for running away, this relationship would never be restored. And hear me, let's just think about their rights. Onesimus, I don't deserve to be a slave. This isn't right. I trusted Jesus. I've done this. I've done that. Why should I have to suffer like this? Philemon, I own this slave. He stole from me. And then he ran away with my stuff. That's just not right. I have a right to my stuff. Guess what's never happening? Restoration. But as soon as the they, these men begin to focus on their responsibility instead of their right, we'll see what happens. Each needed to focus on God's purpose for his life, for their relationship. They each had a responsibility to do right towards each other. There's a reality this morning of injustice, but let's move forward. Second of all, not just the reality of injustice. I want us to see the revelation of Christian grace. You and I cannot remove all of the wrongs and injustices in our fallen world. But we can be instruments of God's grace in the midst of it. Let me say it again. We can't remove the unfairness and injustice, but we can show God's grace in the midst of it. When there is injustice, there's an opportunity for grace. I want us to... See, our responsibility as a Christian, first of all, is to love every believer in Christ. We are commanded to love every believer in Christ. When someone's going through difficulty, be an instrument of grace to show his love toward them. If you looked around and saw almost every hand up, and honestly, every hand could have been up in regards to who's been who's faced injustice and been treated unfairly, that means there's injustice all around. Somebody needs love today. Somebody needs to be shown God's love. Many times unfair un, or, or hard circumstances in life open up a door of opportunity to share Jesus. Amen. That's what we've done as a church. I think back to just two or three months ago as we have a time to change some oil for those that are facing difficulty in life. If you would have heard some of the stories, and perhaps some of you did, as you talked with uh, many of the ladies that came through, feel so bad, unfair circumstances. Uh, one who had lost her husband, and a few years later, been remarried, and then lost the husband again. 
uh, th this and that, and we could go on. What was, what was that? It's an opportunity to show love. To show that, hey, we may not have all the answers, but we know one who does. We may, may not be able to meet all your needs, but we can love you and show you Christ. We can love God and love people. That was the situation with Paul and Onesimus. Paul could have sat in his cell, complained about being a prisoner, didn't deserve this. All I was ever doing was living for God. Why do I have to be in this prison? But instead, he witnessed to Onesimus. He shared the grace of God. And I'm responsible. As a child of God, we're responsible to love everyone. God doesn't approve when we have respected persons. God doesn't approve when we're partial or prejudiced. He loves all. Even those we may consider unprofitable. Amen. He wants us to love each other. There may be someone in your life who is unjust and unfair to you. Our responsibility is to love and show the grace of God to that person. Here's what we'll find. Our hearts will change towards them. Their behavior may not. Their attitude may not change. We can't control that. But we can control our attitude and our conduct. And we can be an example of the believer. Love every believer. That's the revelation we've been given. What else? Encourage every believer. There are people, as we mentioned, who are suffering, need encouragement, a reminder of God's love. I'll be honest, sometimes it's difficult to know what to say. How do we interact with someone going through difficulty? But we must find ways to demonstrate God's grace to them. We have the opportunity to refresh and renew their spirits with words of hope. We'll never understand the value and the power of a word of encouragement. In a difficult time. It's impossible to overstate this. Many times. Those suffering through injustice. Here it is. Feel isolated. And alone. Paul knew what it was like to stand alone. In 2 Timothy 4. Here's what he said. At my first answer. No man stood with me. But all men forsook me. And that was true. If you've been with us on Sunday nights, we saw how when he first came to Christ, he didn't have any friends. No man stood with him. He was alone. How do we encourage every believer in Christ? Well, in this passage, the first thing that Paul did was reviewed. Reviewed him. Reviewed Onesimus. Verse 11. We've looked at it a few times. Which in time past was to the unprofitable. But now profitable to thee and to me. He's telling Philemon, I want you to review your assessment of Onesimus for a moment. <laughs> he once was unprofitable to you. But can I tell you, Philemon, times have changed. You know what we can we do often in and of our, ourselves and of our flesh? We make a judgment of someone and we write them off from here on out. Never review. Maybe perhaps God's working in their life. How many of you would say you're a different person than you were five years ago? You raise your hand. How many of you God's working in your life and bringing you closer to him perhaps even this time a year ago or ten years ago? I'm glad I'm not what I used to be. I'm glad I'm trying my best to draw closer to him Heaven forbid if someone would have written me off a year ago or five years ago. In our human nature, it's, it's, it's natural for us to write someone off because of something they may have done. He's saying, Philemon, don't write him off. God's doing the work. Don't make a judgment and write someone off forever. It's worth taking another look. God is working oftentimes in someone's life. And it's up to us to encourage them and not turn them away. Verse 15, he says, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant. So he says, I want you to review him, but second of all, I want you to receive him. I want you to receive him as a brother. By the way, 
this is, again, shows how God's word has the answer. It doesn't condone slavery. It actually tells us the answer for it. In Christ, we're all equal. Uh -huh. Philemon, Onesimus was your slave. Not no more, buddy. I want you to receive him as a brother. And I've been commanded to treat all as a brother in Christ. Yeah. No matter what color skin, no matter what side of the tracks, no matter what culture, no matter what language, no matter what background, all together in Christ. We're all equal in his eyes. I must not have a superior, a judgmental attitude towards someone. It's my duty to treat everyone as a brother. Reach out to them as they suffer. That's the revelation of Christian grace. There's a reality of injustice. And finally this morning, I want us to see the restoration of fellowship. Unfortunately, what's true in our society is that injustice breeds division. Injustice breeds jealousy. Look around in our country. Look around over this last year. Divisions growing between ethnic groups, between economic groups in America. And I will just say this. I, the answer is not social justice. Oh, that's a popular phrase and a popular thing that you're going to hear. And, and the social justice is the answer. No, inherently man is not good. We don't need social reform. We must have spiritual reform. Amen. The problem is not a social problem. It's a spiritual problem in our nation. And God's word tells us very clear. You've got Philemon. You've got his slave Onesimus. Don't receive him as a servant. In Christ, we're all one. We're all equal. Treat him as a brother. Amen. Yeah. The answer is not speaking out about this or speaking out about this. It's finding Jesus. Right. It's following his prescription. It's obeying his word. We can organize all we want and we can facilitate this and have this come together. But until we unite around the truth of Jesus and the love of Christ, there's no hope for social reform. You, you see it all around. People are even trying to exploit these divisions. Yep. And, and for personal political gain, our job as children of God is to be peacemakers, to restore fellowship where it's been broken through Jesus. Share him. Share his word today. If you and I have treated someone unjustly, unfairly, it's our job to seek them out, to make amends. You see, restoration of fellowship is based on forgiveness. Restoration is predicated on forgiveness for the injustice that has been done. Verse 17, if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Paul is asking for complete, full forgiveness. Philemon to give to Onesimus. You know what's interesting about this? Notice verse number eight. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. As we study this and study the rest of the verses, here's what Paul opened up by saying. Hey, Philemon, I'm an apostle. I have power from the Lord. I have the authority to tell you what to do in this situation. He says, if I wanted to, I can make you forgive. But that's not true forgiveness when it's demanded. It needs to be offered willingly, verse 14. Uh, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. Come from the heart. True change cannot be brought about by forced words, by ready-made statements. It must come from the Holy Spirit convicting, working in our heart. And I love what this forgiveness was based upon. He says in verse 18, the last phrase, put that on mine account. Sounds a whole lot like what Jesus did for us. Amen. He sees the 
righteousness of the Father, the holiness of God, sees that God cannot accept us as sinners and says, I'm going to take their sin. I'm going to put it on my shoulders. I'm going to put it on my account. And now, God, when you look at them, I want you to see me. He put it on his account, took the weight, the penalty of our sin, placed it on ourselves. And hear me, because God has forgiven us, we can and should forgive others. Amen. Is there someone who's treated you unjustly? Is there someone that you harbor hatred in your heart towards? On the basis of God's forgiveness to you, do whatever you can to forgive them. You may not be able to change their attitude, you may not be able to change their behavior, but you can free yourself from the bondage of bitterness by forgiving them. You see, when, when there's an unforgiving uh, spirit, there's someone in chains, and oftentimes we think if I forgive them, I'm loosing them from the chains of what they did to me. Oh, but that's backwards. You see, the truth of the matter is, when I'm harboring an unforgiving spirit and heart and bitterness towards someone, I'm the one that's in chains. And when I forgive, I'm loosing someone from the bondage of chains that they're holding me in. I'm not saying, I'm not accepting what they've done. I'm not agreeing with the injustice, but I'm freeing myself from the bondage of bitterness. Hebrews 12 says, do this lest the root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Forgiving spirit. Another individual doesn't have the power to keep you enslaved unless you refuse to extend forgiveness. And finally, restoration isn't just based on forgiveness, but it brings great joy. Verse 20. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my vows in the Lord. There's joy in reconciliation. There's joy in forgiveness. It's wonderful to see God work restoring, reconciling relationships. You see, injustice, broken relationships abound today. But God's grace can give us the victory. According to history and according to tradition, as we study Later on, what happens in Onesimus' life? He returns to Philemon. He's freed by Philemon. And he becomes a respected leader in the church and later a pastor at the church at Ephesus. Wow. Following the footsteps of John and Timothy and leading a church in a very important city. Someone who faced unfair circumstances. Someone who faced injustice. God used the unjust circumstances of his life to prepare him to be used for God's work. And he wants to do the same for you. Hear me. Just because it's happened doesn't mean God wanted it to or brought it to. But it does mean God has allowed it and he can use it to make you more like him. He can use it to mold you into a vessel that can be used for his glory and for his honor. We can have victory over injustice in our lives to accomplish God's purpose. Let's have victory over injustice. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer this morning. Thank you for listening.